I have one more pleasurable duty to perform, uh, and that's to, uh, to introduce our, uh, our third plenary speaker. Um, Trevor Calling, who's a, a longtime friend and co-conspirator, uh, is a Professor of Christian Education at uh, Canterbury Christchurch University uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, but this latest professional title of his is at best the shortest of shorthands for a long and distinguished career inside and outside the academy, working to connect Christian concerns about faith formation in schools to the wider world of religious education. In the United Kingdom, religious education has long been a compulsory subject in all schools, Christian or secular, private or public, <clears throat> and that leads to fascinating and politically volatile conversations about what it means for teachers who, who may or may not be people of faith to teach religion to students who may or may not be people of faith. And Trevor's been at the heart of those conversations for a long time and has become an important player in them and has showed a repeated knack for quietly designing projects that matter, that make a difference to teachers and to the wider conversation. He's made significant contributions to the research discussion about faith and education. Um, if you haven't yet picked up a copy of his latest book out on the campus store there, you need one. Um, and at the same time, his work has always exhibited a clear focus on classroom practice and, and benefiting practicing teachers. The What If Learning website, which some of you know, which has been used by thousands of teachers and is about to appear in Russian in a, in a new version in, uh, developed by teachers in Ukraine. Uh, came about at Trevor's suggestion, and both he and Beth Green were part of the team that designed it. Um, the latest book that I mentioned, which is titled, um, uh, has the title of Christian Faith in English Church Schools, Research Conversations with Classroom Teachers. I would ask you not to be misled by the title into thinking that that book is not relevant to you if you're not studying English church schools. Um, I just recently gave copies of that book to some teachers at uh, a Reformed Christian school just down the road, and they immediately recognized themselves and their own colleagues in the case studies that, uh, uh, that Trevor and Beth and the other authors in that book were discussing. Um, and it's, it's a book you need to pay attention to. Um, so one of the perks of planning this conference is to get to create space for presenters who really should be heard outside of their, their usual setting. And so I'm very pleased to have been able to bring Trevor across the pond uh, to speak to us here. Thank you, Trevor. Well, I'm glad that bit's over. I was dreading what you might say. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for still being here. Um, that's an achievement, isn't it, in itself, just still to be here on a Saturday uh, lunchtime. Um, and um, what I'm going to try and do today is to introduce you to some of the debates that are going on in the British scene and some of the people who are contributing to that as a way of helping to illuminate a general question. Uh, and by way of introduction, I want to start with um, this gentleman, uh, Tim Farron. Uh, now, you're probably aware that um, we've recently had an election last June. Um, it wasn't quite as dramatic as the election that you had in the States, but it was pretty dramatic because um, it resulted in a prime minister who thought that she would sweep the board and get an increased majority, finding that she was left without the majority that she needed. So it was an interesting thing. But I want to focus on one political leader, this guy, Tim Farron. Um, he led the Liberal Democrat Party, and uh, he had the rather uncomfortable experience of having his personal beliefs interrogated. And it was over the issue of um, gay marriage. And um, he was known to be an evangelical Christian. And there was one TV pre uh, presenter who grilled him about his personal views on gay marriage, and um, she didn't let go, and he never answered her questions about what he actually believed. And, at the end, and this came to dominate the campaign, so all the policies of the Liberal Democrats got lost in this particular issue. And um, what happened was, in the end, uh, was that he resigned. So the election came and he simply resigned. And this is what he had to say about it, that to be a political leader and to live as a committed Christian, to hold faithfully to the Bible's teaching has felt impossible. 
And I was really saddened by that. I haven't heard him go further on that. He's doing that at a Christian think tank in a few weeks' time. He's going to talk about this. But it just struck me as tragic that in modern Britain, a major political leader who has a clear, biblically-rooted faith finds it impossible to serve in public life. Now, a lot of people would say, what's so terrible about public life that creates this situation? I want to ask the question, how is it that as a church we've got ourselves in this position where we can't do this? So that's what I want to pursue. And I'm interested in looking at what we mean by teaching and learning and how our understanding of teaching and learning prepares people for public life. Now, I was a bit um, uh, alarmed last night when Ken badly asked Beth a question because um, it's exactly the question that I'm hoping to deal with in this um, lecture. And I was really worried that Beth was going to take away my uh, lecture with one um, answer to a question. But fortunately, that, that didn't happen. So I've still got something little to say. Um, but um, I'm going to explore it through uh, some of the experiences that we've had in our research and uh, some wider literature. Um, and um, I want to start by introducing you to uh, a, a rising star, to use that phrase that we had last night, a lady called Anna Strahan, who is um, a researcher at the University of Kent, and she's very interested in how evangelical churches operate, and she does ethnographic studies. Um, she's a very gifted scholar. I think you will hear her name widely in the future. Um, her own personal background is that she uh, came from an evangelical Christian tradition. She was very strong in her uh, attendance at Christian University. She's wavered a bit on that, but she's really interested in how the evangelical churches work. And her doctorate was about two evangelical churches, which she spent, she immersed herself in them. She spent time going to meetings, she joined the activities, she became part of the service groups, uh, and she wrote about it and the experience. And one of these churches was what she called um, a traditional apologetics church, where the defense of the faith was seen as fundamentally important. And she particularly explored with the professional people in that congregation how the church helped them in defending the faith in their professional roles outside the church context. Um, and this is um, what she had to say about her findings, that what she found was a sense of awkwardness about speaking for faith in the public context. So the, 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 what was going on was actually that the, the, the congregational encouragement was you must go out there, you must stand for the faith, you must um, commend the faith, uh, you must ensure that people know where the world is going wrong, and you do that through your professional life. These people finding that that was just impossible to do in the public context they were in, and then there was developing this culture of shame and people feeling that they were, they were not being good Christians in public life because they found this so difficult. Um, now, that actually mirrored something that we found in the research findings for the project that um, David mentioned and that um, Beth and I were involved in. Uh, and what we were looking there was at how teachers in English church schools, those schools sponsored by the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church, they're public schools, but they are church foundations, how they rose to the challenge that the church was putting to them to be distinctively Christian in their classrooms. And we didn't do very much in terms of training them. We just gave them a very brief introduction to the what-if learning sort of ideas. And then 
we watched them, we spent time in their classrooms, we interviewed them, we talked with them, we talked with the children who they were teaching, and we spent a year with these teachers just observing them. And what we've done is they've written them all up as little portraits. So in the book, there's a, there's a portrait of, of, of these teachers and how they've gone through this experience. And we had some really positive um, responses, and we had some struggling responses. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the positive responses a bit later on, but I want just to share with you the struggling responses, because I think they're revealing. Um, and uh, one of these teachers was a maths teacher. Um, and um, she was a very keen Christian. She was, in fact, in charge of what they called the Christian ethos of the school, so she was in charge of the worship programs and things. Um, and she had a go at this, and she wanted to teach Christianly in her maths lesson. And it was a very intriguing experience because we sat in the maths lesson and we could feel the difficulties of what was going on. And in her interviews afterwards, she used this word to describe the experience. And it became a sort of um, catchphrase, a, a caption that um, captured a, one of the aspects of teacher's experience of trying to do this thing of teaching in a distinctively Christian way. It was weird. And actually, she even introduced the lesson in that way, because what she said to the children is, we're going to do something weird. Um, and um, it, it created a, ve a very definite culture. Um, and one of the things that, um, that she said about the, the experience was that she felt that she was having to lever in stuff into the discipline of mathematics that didn't belong there. So she sort of had this sense that there was, in between the trigonometry and the algebra, she'd got to sort of put in uh, a bit of the Christian stuff and tell youngsters that uh, they were sinners and needed salvation. And, um, uh, and that was how she interpreted it. Um, what we found amongst some of the teachers was that being distinctively Christian was interpreted to them as having to tell children what to believe. Um, so to give you an example, we watched one geography teacher who was a very gifted teacher, um, and she designed this lesson and we were sitting in it, and we felt awkward. She clearly felt awkward. The children felt awkward and wondered what was going on. And when we unpacked it with her afterwards, it was all to do with her questioning style. And the issue was that she was normally a very divergent questioner. So she would ask questions which opened up discussion, opened up debate, but when she got into doing this distinctively Christian lesson, she went convergent. So all her questions became looking for the right answer. And everybody felt, as I said, deeply uncomfortable at this. Um, and uh, when she talked about it afterwards, it was because she said, well, she felt that uh, if she was teaching Christian values, that was what was sort of expected. Um, and um, so, uh, to go back to our maths teacher, um, she described the uh, task of being distinctively Christian in lessons as banging in a plenary, um, which I thought was a lovely phrase. Um, and uh, we've, so we've got all these teachers who are very committed to the idea. None of them were resistant to the idea of a distinctively Christian classroom but they really struggled with what it was that they were trying to do. Uh, now, we didn't, the research, the empirical research, couldn't take us further into that, but what I want to do is to suggest some theological reasons as what's going on here, which reveals something about assumptions that many Christians have about what it means to be Christian. So that's what I'll do in a few moments.
What I want to look at in particular is how teachers think about the way in which the Bible operates as a source of knowledge for the Christian community. Because somewhere in all this, I have a hunch that this is fairly critical. And I want to look at how teachers who believe that the Bible is an authority in life seek to interpret that into their approaches to teaching and learning. So that's the task that I've set myself for today. Before I do that, I want to just paint the culture in which that uh, adherence to the authority of Scripture is operating. Um, and I want to look at how scholars are relating that notion of the authority of Scripture to the concept of learning. And to start that off, uh, I want, I'm going to refer to a paper which was produced by uh, Ruth Deakin Crick and Helen Gels, where they were looking at uh, the notion of spirituality in learning. And one of the things they identified about learning was the importance of self-authorship. Now, put in other ways, they're talking about constructivist approaches to learning. The notion that learning is not just receiving other people's stuff given to you by an external authority, but it is about making it your own. So for learning to be meaningful, it is something that you have to have constructed and authored for yourself. So that's a very strongly sort of typical constructivist view. There are quite a lot of authors out there, and I think it's in the general culture, who see a sense that the Bible is an authority as being counter to that sense of being able to learn for yourself. And, for example, Peter Vardy um, sees problems with the reliance on the authority of the Bible because how you read the Bible depends so much on your approach to the text and what are your particular interests. And that gets ignored if you just treat the Bible as an external authority. Um, uh, another scholar called John Hull talked about the results of treating the Bible as an authority is that you get an unchanging theology. Um, so he would say that if people believe the Bible is an authority with an unchanging message, what happens is that those who then receive that message cannot learn anymore. Um, and it therefore becomes irrelevant. And he particularly, he, he wrote a book called What Prevents Christian Adults from Learning? And he explores the idea there that one of the challenges to Christian adults is that they hold on to very um, uh, infantile understandings of their faith because they make the assumption that it's an unchanging faith. So they don't develop. Um, so uh, there are these issues. Um, another uh, pair of scholars called Christopher Rowlands, <coughs> excuse me, and Jonathan Roberts say that what relying on the authority of scripture leads to is uh, a sense of teaching and learning as being what they call baton exchange the sort of passing on of a fixed object from one tradition, from one generation, to the next. Um, and uh, I can give you an example of this, actually, from a project where I was involved in, where uh, a, uh, a group decided that they wanted to produce a text where theologians and educationists work together to produce a book about Christian education. And the way they structured the task was that the theologians did preliminary work on the theology. So they did the theology, and then they gave the theology to the educationists, and the educationists supplied it. So that was the, the model they used. Um, and there was one fascinating moment when the person, the theologian who was doing the uh, theology of God that educationists need to have, 
She went away and did her work and she came back and the result that she gave them was God is not a learner. So then this group of educationists have got to develop a Christian education based around the notion that God is not a learner. Well, that gets difficult if you're actually wanting the children to understand that um, uh, uh, Christian maturity is about um, becoming more like God or more like Christ. Um, so the less you learn, the more you are like God. Um, now... If you've got that sort of baton exchange process, there is no development in the theology that's allowed. So no questions were allowed back from the educationists to the theologians. So that's the baton exchange model of the authority of scripture. Um, and um, uh, they were quite critical of it, and they, uh, they thought it was very hierarchical, um, and uh, they advocated a different model um, which challenged that. Um, and John Hull uh, talked about some approaches to biblical authority uh, as though it's like squatters taking up residence in the vast mansion of the Bible, uh, which is really public property, but they refuse to let anyone else in unless they become like the people who have already squat squatted there. Um, so you get this um, uh, approach to, to biblical authority. Now... I think that what was happening in our teachers and what was happening in the congregation that Anna Strand studied was that somehow they had this sense of biblical authority as operating like this sort of uh, baton exchange thing where you just tell people what the Bible says and it gets transmitted down. And that they were struggling to see how that related to the models of pedagogy which they had imbibed as professionals, as teachers who had been trained in, in, in pedagogy, and that they didn't know how to negotiate this territory. So they got left with this weirdness experience, cognitive dissonance, to use the technical term. Um, now, what's the usual response to that? Well, what the response you get is often called constructivism. Now, I've called this bit radical constructivism because this is the extreme end of constructivism. Uh, but it's a response that you often get from those who are very critical of the notion of biblical authority in learning. And here are two people uh, that I want to introduce you to who are radical constructivists who are very influential in the British scene. And it just struck me, actually, that um, you can tell that constructivism is very good for you by just looking at their faces, can't you? So um, it makes you a cheerful person. OK, well, let's have a look, see what they had to say. Um, they, um, they developed certain ideas about constructivism, uh, and particularly in how it relates to the religious domain. Um, and um, one of the things that they argued about constructivism is what it tells us about knowledge. And they were clear that knowledge is purely a human construction. So they were arguing that when you get religion, it's not knowledge that actually is true. It doesn't reflect any ontological reality. It is actually just something that human beings create. Um, and they therefore emphasised the learner. So this is where you head towards what we would call child-centred education, where it's the learner that generates the knowledge and it's not in any sense related to an external truth or reality. Um, and their view is that when these constructions get put together into a set of doctrines which are held by a religious community, actually what they are is developed ways of looking after the interests of that particular community. So they're about power. They're about influence in society. So what effect does that have on learning? Well, for Clive Erica, he would say that, that when you get to learning in religion, the religion actually really has no particular role in the inquiry other than to be a catalyst. 
Now, out of this, we had an approach called um, uh, the gift of the child, which was an approach to uh, religious education in British schools. And what it did was to take um, bits and pieces out of religious traditions as nuggets which were then used to help children respond in creative and authentic ways. So they were almost like sort of um, uh, uh, grit in the, in the oyster that creates the pearl, but the pearl belongs to the oyster. It's got nothing to do with the grit. Um, so the religion becomes almost irrelevant. And uh, they described learning as constructing and voicing our own fictions within a listening community. Okay, so what a child is doing in religious education is learning how to construct their own fictions. And Clive Erica taught that in order to be a good teacher, you've got to side with the relativists, because this is obviously a very strongly relativist position. So um, that's a radically constructivist view. So what I've painted to you is a view which sees the Bible as an authority and learning being the transmission of that authoritative teaching to the children and a response to that, which is radical constructivism. And in the middle, Christian teachers thinking that's the choice uh, and not knowing where to go. And therefore, they feel very uh, uh, compromised by that and find it difficult to negotiate. So I want to explore that a bit further. Um, and um, it seems to me that what constructivism is doing is asking, is there the potential for creativity and change and the recognition that the reader's context creates different responses to a text and therefore diversity in reading and interpretation. Are these features of constructivism compatible with a sense of holding to the authority of scripture? Because if they aren't, I think teachers are struggling to find ways of thinking about biblical learning. So my question is, can a Bible-following Christian embrace these? So I've put at the centre of this debate then how teachers think about the sort of knowledge that's constructed in an encounter with the Bible um, so it's an epistemological issue that we're looking at. Now, I'm now going to go into a way that I use with teachers to look at the, the options here as to uh, the different ways of approaching it. And I'm sure that many of you will know this uh, picture. Um, I suspect one or two of you might have seen me use it before. I know uh, some people have. But um, uh, OK, you've got a picture there. Okay, uh, I wonder what you see. You might just quickly tell the person next to you what you see. Just for 20 seconds. Okay, you had your chance. Um, anyone like to say, what, what do you see? What do you see in that picture? A lady. A lady. Okay. A young lady. An old lady. Okay. A witch. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you what is there. Okay. And I can tell you that the picture is of a young woman. Okay? Now, how do I know this? Well, I know it because that's all I've ever seen. Now, there are some people who tell me that there's an old woman in the picture. 
But that just illustrates that there are some people who are deluded in life, doesn't it? <laughs> because it's very clear that if you look at the picture, that there is only a young woman. Now, that's what I want to call positivist certain Christianity. Because uh, that's how some people feel the Bible operates. They've read stuff in the Bible. God speaks through the Bible. What they have read is God's word. And therefore, anybody else who thinks otherwise must be deluded. Because it's pretty clear that you know, God has spoken. Uh, let me show you um, an advert which actually uh, I owe to David. Um, I don't know whether you've ever come across this Bible. Okay. God's Word. The Bible translation that says what it means. Okay. Uh, I hope you've got this Bible. This is really useful uh, when you're in discussion with other Christians. Because uh, probably they've got the wrong Bible that doesn't say what it means. <laughs> no interpretation needed. Uh, the Bible, the all-time bestseller, but hardly the best understood. God's Word. This is the revolutionary new translation that allows you to immediately understand exactly what the original writers meant. That's the advertising blurb. Okay. Don't you wish? Don't you wish you'd got it? Um, so that's a perception of the authority of Scripture, which I think is carried around in a sort of positivist state. And why I say positivist is because it's, it's like a lot of people think about science. You know, there's the world. We human beings look at the world. We find out what the world is, and then we know. And there's no debate about it. Um, here's a little um, uh, brief sort of interlude on this one. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've ever come across this book, The Year of Living Biblically, by A.J. Jacobs. I don't know whether it's the same Alan Jacobs that Beth was talking about, but um, he writes about his, his journalistic project where he was going to read the Bible and then live a biblical life for a year. And actually, if you go onto the web, you'll find his um, uh, story and you'll see that his beard grows over the year. And, uh, and he's got one or two quotes. Here's one of them. My wife's a saint. Uh, at one point, I built a biblical hut in our living room uh, following Old Testament uh, festival celebrations. Uh, this is the one I like about his relationship with his wife and how it affected the... Um, it was affected by this attempt to live biblically for the OK, so you can see there are challenges involved in being biblically faithful. OK, um, Christopher Wright, uh, uh, shouldn't show you things like that because you never can move on. Yeah. Christopher Wright, uh, who is a, an English Old Testament scholar um, and uh, uh, runs... Um, uh, the uh, project that John Stott set up for um, the um, Latin project for bringing pastors for theological training. Uh, he actually talks about how there are quite uh, embedded misunderstandings of the way in which scripture operates. Uh, and uh, he identifies two. One is that we impose on the notion of an authoritative text a militarist understanding of authority. So we think the Bible barks orders. So it operates as a, a, like a sergeant major in our lives. Um, and the other suggestion he makes is that people take a solely literalist, I put positivist there in brackets, understanding of sacred text. So they treat every text as though it's uh, a handbook or a scientific textbook and don't ask questions about genre and how genre operates. Um, and um, what happens is that uh, this leads to a transmissionist uh, rather than what I'm going to call an interpretive approach to scripture. Okay, so we've looked at um, what is often seen to be a way of living under the authority of the Bible. Um, so let's go back to our uh, young woman, old woman, because what's the alternative to that sort of approach? Um, 
Well, maybe what we have to do is to recognise that there's both an old woman and a young woman. They're both legitimate understandings, interpretations of this picture. Now, when I did this exercise with a group of teachers once, uh, uh, and I asked them the question, I ask you, what's, um, uh, what's it, what do you see? And um, there was one teacher, a bit like Jan, who uh, decided to push me on the exercise, and uh, she said this. What she saw was a goat. <laughs> Can you see the goat? Basically, what she was doing was saying, actually, what you see is entirely up to you. It is your interpretation. No one can challenge it because that is what it is to be a human being. You make your own interpretation and you live your life that way. Now, that's the radical constructivist thing. That's a relativist Christianity where you just create the meaning for yourself. I have seen loads of teaching where that happens in classrooms. Um, one of the classic examples we have in England is the story of Joseph, where teachers teach it by using the um, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. Um, and they focus on the song, Any Dream Will Do. So Joseph is, that's fine. That suits the modern age. What a wonderful way of using Joseph. Okay, so it's a totally constructive. It doesn't worry about the text. It just um, jumps off the text. I want to suggest to you there's a third way, and we've been using some of the language over the last um, uh, 24 hours to do with um, uh, a view of knowledge. And um, it actually goes like this. Here's the picture. What do we see in the picture? Is there an old woman or a young woman? And the response to that is, well, that's an important question. That's an interesting question. This is what I'm going to call the, the critical realist Christianity approach, which um, uh, is becoming very influential now. And uh, there are lots of people around now. I don't know whether any of you know this guy. Anybody recognize him? A guy called Richard Edlin, who is, uh, David recognizes it, he's an Australian. Um, and he writes about reformed critical realism. Uh, so I thought that would be a good thing for Calvin, um, somebody who writes about reformed critical realism. And um, basically, there are three aspects to critical realism. First of all, the notion of ontological realism, which is the sense that there is an authoritative reality which we, as human beings, have a responsibility to seek to discover and work out. So there is an authoritative meaning, if you like, in a Bible text if you um, uh, apply it to the, the reading of the Bible. However, this is the postmodern bit. It recognises that it's human beings who are reading the text. And human beings are interpreters who don't necessarily get it right. So at the level of what we actually know about what is ontologically real, there is relativism, because we are all trying to understand something which we cannot understand fully in the human state. So it's a recognition of the fallibility of the interpreter. So, why is it, do you think, that liberation theology emerged in the favelas of Brazil and prosperity theology emerged in the wealthy cities of the Western world? Isn't that interesting? Is there a possibility that people were reading the text in ways that mattered to their particular context and served their particular interests. That's the insight of uh, epistemic relativism. And then the last part of, um, uh, of reform critical realism is to say, as learners, what's important is that we learn to make judgments about 
the strength of those different understandings that people are proposing. So it's about critically understanding, discussing, debating, looking for evidence, exploring that diversity of interpretation. So in relation to the picture of the old woman, young woman, it would be about some of you trying to come up here to try and persuade me that if I look at the picture in a particular way, if I take note of particular lines, I will see the old woman. Okay, so you try and persuade me. The exercise of judgmental rationality, key to learning. Um, so this, this is an approach which I think helps, will help teachers, Christian teachers, work through some of the difficulties they're in. Let me just illustrate two um, ways in which it's used. Um, this is a piece of work by a, a guy called Mark Allen Powell uh, on biblical text and how people read text. And he took this parable. Um, can you see which parable it is? The prodigal son, okay. Well, he gave the text to of seminary students in America, seminary students in Russia, and sem seminary students in Tanzania. And interesting enough, the seminary students in America saw it as a parable about individual responsibility of the son who had squandered the money. The Russian um, seminary students saw it as, uh, as a parable about the blight of famine and what that does to somebody, uh, working from their sort of experience of the Second World War. Uh, and the Tanzanian students uh, saw it as a parable about the ir irresponsibility of the host society that allowed a young man to end up in a pigsty. Um, so they all read it differently. Now, when working with children, one of the interesting things is, what difference to the interpretation of the parable is there depending on the title that you give it? All different titles. Different parables, same story. Okay? So the interpretation has uh, changed depending on the particular aspect of the parable that you seek to notice. So that's an example of a critical realist approach where uh, there is an accepted sort of authority to the parable, but the epistemic level, there are many understandings of it, and the debate about it is, well, to what degree are these legitimate interpretations which drives you back to the text? But it almost also may drive you back to the context of the person who's reading it, because actually, maybe it is, uh, for people who live in famine-stricken countries, more legitimate to focus on that than on uh, so-called one authoritative meaning. Now, I'm going to give you another example of um, how this works. And um, some of you may be familiar with this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if you've been to London, uh, it's a map of the London Underground System. I have a tea towel. Yeah. <laughs> you can buy these if you want. I'll leave it so you can see it if you want later on. Um, is that a true map. Now, if I ask um, students this question, uh, some of them say, well, no, it's not. It's not a true map. And if you say to them, why is it not true? They'll usually say, well, because actually it doesn't actually have an accurate representation of the land because actually the distance between Baker Street and Regent's Park is not proportionate to the distance between Pad Paddington and uh, Bayswater. So it's not an accurate representation of what's actually on the ground. So it's, it's a wrong map. <coughs> but is it a wrong map? Because actually, it's one of the most brilliant ways for getting around London. It does the job. It's 
it, it actually helps you navigate the London underground system. So it's a way of reading the ground, if you like, the actual, what's actually there, in order to enable you to achieve a particular task, getting around London. Now, Christopher Wright, who uses this analogy, says that this map is a little bit like what happens with the Bible when people interpret the Bible. They are often using the Bible for a particular purpose. They're trying to answer a particular question in their own life. What they come up with is certainly constrained by the text because you can't put Paddington over on the east of London because that would just wouldn't work because it's not there. But it actually isn't a, a sort of literal representation because what you're doing is to try and answer a particular question. So that's two examples of what I'm talking about. Now I want to go on and look at um, how this might help us with, um, with teachers. And I want to use um, a model developed by a theologian called Anthony, Th Anthony Thistleton. Um, Thistleton um, has been seen in, in the British context as, as one of the founders of biblical, rigorous biblical hermeneutics. Some of you, I'm sure, uh, have come across his work. Um, and he wanted to ask the question, what happens when a Christian reads the text of the Bible, what's going on? So he shifted the discussion from what's the content of the Bible to what's happening when Christians read the Bible. So he was looking at the process. Um, and he made a number of points. He, he's a very, um, he's not an easy writer to read and even his introduction to hermeneutics uh, is quite a stretch. Um, but, so I've really simplified this down and probably uh, 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 he would be horrified by that, but we'll see. Um, so this is trying to make it work for teachers. What he has to say is this. Everybody comes to the text with a pre-understanding. Okay, so we, we never approach it clean and in a neutral way. We all bring things to the text. Um, some people say that leads to what they call a hermeneutics of suspicion. Now, what they mean by that is that people are always using the text for their own purposes and their own ends, so we should be very suspicious about all interpretations of the text. That's one response to it. Um, uh, Thistleton's response is to say, well, yeah, there is some truth in it, because we are all guilty of using texts to support our own ideas and theories. But actually, if you say that you must let the text remain in control, that limits the legitimacy of the interpretations that people can make. You can't just make the text mean anything you want. You are constrained by the actual text itself. So what he's developed is an approach to reading the Bible, which says the first responsibility is what he calls the hermeneutics retrieval. That's all the hard work in trying to work out what the original author intended, the intended meeting, meaning, um, and that that is a priority. So it's the grit and hard work of looking at commentaries, asking questions about what this would have meant in the original context, the original author, and so on and so forth. He also argues for a hermeneutics of trust, which means that when we approach scripture, we read it trusting its authority in our lives, that what we're trying to do is to follow its teaching. But, and this is, I think, one of the critical things, he also argues for a hermeneutics of self-suspicion. And what he means by that is that as Christian learners, Christians reading the Bible, what we should do is always ask questions about the context of the reader, and particularly if we're the reader, our own tendencies to read things that are in uh, favoring our own interests, recognizing that as wealthy people, we do tend towards the 
prosperity theology rather more than the liberation theology. That's the natural tendency. So he's saying that reading the text is not just about discovering <coughs> what's in the text and transmitting it. It's about asking questions about how I relate to the text. Now, what does that mean for learning? Well, what I suggest it does is it means that the learning process focuses not just on discovering what's in the Bible text, but also examining carefully the context in which that Bible is being read. So to go back to my book that was being put together that I described earlier on about Christian education, if you take what Thistleton says seriously, the process of constructing the book would not have been the theologians giving the educationists a whole load of received stuff which they then apply. It would be about the educationists saying, these are the issues in our context, and handing those to the theologians for them to, to work with when they're doing their text, and then for the conversation to go backwards and forwards between text and context, so that the learning process becomes cyclical. Now, um, just to give you an example of what this might look like, um, this is a very well-known analogy, and I'm sure some of you have heard it before, by a scholar called N.T. Wright, who asked, what's going on when um, we're trying to live under the authority of the text as uh, uh, people who uh, regard the Bible as authoritative? And he used the analogy of a Shakespeare play, um, and he said it's rather as though we discover a Shakespeare play which has got four acts complete and the final fifth act is missing. There are all sorts of variations on this, so I'm just giving you a, a fairly simple form of it. And his, uh, his question was, how would you finish the play? Um, because Shakespeare's gone, we've got the four acts, we want the fifth act to be able to mount the play. And his suggestion is that you would get together uh, lots and lots of... Uh, uh, Shakespeare scholars who would write their own endings and debate them. And uh, this is what he has to say about the result. The authority of the first four acts would not consist, could not consist in an implicit command that the actors should repeat the earlier parts of the play over and over again. It would require of the actors a free and responsible entry into the story as it stood in order to understand first how the threads could be appropriately drawn together and then to put that understanding to effect by speaking and acting with both consistency and innovation. In other words, you can't just write anything because it's got to be under the authority of the first four acts. So it's got to be consistent with that authority. But there will be innovation because different people will write different endings depending on what their own context and interests are at that particular point in time. And uh, Tom Wright says that as Christians, what we are is like people trying to write the fifth act of the Bible. Um, we are looking for and at a vocation to be the people of God in the fifth act of the drama of creation. Now, I want to suggest to you that's what learning is. It's about trying to understand how the word of God works out in the situation of life in which we exist now. And sometimes we will find that our previous interpretations of scripture are challenged because we find ourselves in a new context and we realize that that makes us understand that we might have got some things wrong in the past. So to give you a classic example, the church's approach to apartheid in South Africa changed, not because the Bible changed, but because they realized that their reading of apartheid in scripture was an error once they were faced with the realities of what it was doing. So, just to finish then, um, biblical authority and what I've called the pedagogical priority, by which I mean that sort of self-authorship idea. Uh, 
What have I been saying? Well, I've been suggesting that what we're looking for in the way in which teachers uh, uh, design teaching and think about learning is faithful creativity, not baton exchange, not just passing things on. It's about the authority of the storyline, the whole teaching of scripture, rather than just individual verses. It's about the text being in control of the processes of interpretation that are going on. It's about a trust in the intended meaning of the authors of scripture being retrievable. Alongside a recognition that new significances of that meaning can emerge in new contexts. That's one of the things that Kevin Van Hooser says, um, that, um, that, that scripture has clear meaning, but many significances. And the significance of a particular meaning will de often depend on the context. And that the ability to contextualize is critical. And self-suspicion is essential. As readers, we should always be critical of ourselves. Okay? So the story of the um, college principal, the seminary principal, who said to a student who was arguing with him about the meaning of a text, uh, and, and the college principal said, um, young man, you are arguing with God, um, needs to be tempered because the idea that there's, when people argue with an interpretation of scripture, that inevitably they must be arguing with God, needs to be challenged because that principle needed to be more suspicious of his own reading. What I'm suggesting to you is that one of the learning ideals is that we're seeking to help children to become wise interpreters, not just actors of something that's been given to them. So I think that what I found in our teachers was two mindsets. They assumed that to be faithfully Christian, they had to work in a positivist mindset. And they assumed that meant transmission of predetermined truth, persuading children that this was what they had to believe, and a monolithic understanding of what the results would be in the classroom. So they had a sort of apologetic view of Christian teaching and learning. It's all about persuasion, transmission, everybody coming out with the same beliefs. What I'm suggesting to you is if you take a critical realist view of teaching and learning as a Christian, that what we're looking at actually is wise interpretation, learning how to debate interpretations, and the acceptance of diversity. And I've called that more of a hermeneutical emphasis. Now, it's not that I'm against apologetics. I'm not. I think apologetics is a very important Christian discipline. But what I'm saying is that I think that teachers who find themselves in apologetic mode will not find it easy to operate in classrooms. So they need to be helped to see that there are other theological disciplines and reproaches of which hermeneutics, I think, may be a very strong one. Um, I just want to finish with one story. I'm a little bit um, uh, over time, but if I can just tell you one story about one of our teachers, um, a religious education teacher uh, called, uh, a pseudonym that we gave her was Angela. Angela was a very successful teacher. In inspections, she had been held up with as ex having excellent results in the major exams that children do at 16. Uh, she'd been filmed uh, as a case study of a model teacher. Uh, and she did Christian ethics courses. And she had one course on uh, end-of-life issues, uh, a topic on assisted suicide. And the way the exam worked was that the students had to give three arguments for and three arguments against assisted suicide using religious viewpoints. And uh, she was very good at this, and what she used to do was to present them with three arguments for assisted suicide, which largely came from humanistic philosophy, three arguments against assisted suicide, which came from uh, the Bible. Um, and so they had Bible verses on the one hand and phrases from um, uh, humanistic philosophy on the other side. Uh, and uh, this, this was sort of Christian ethics. Uh, well, we had a conversation with her about this, and during the course of the conversation where we were probing what the children thought Christian ethics were, was as a result of this experience, 
she gradually came to the realization that what she was doing was inducting the youngsters into a view of Christian ethics, which was, we have the answers, they don't. We have Bible verses which prove that our answers are right and theirs are wrong. And the point of Christian ethics is to win the argument. So when we do Christian ethics, what we're seeking to do is to show that we're right and they're wrong. And the way you do that is you have three Bible verses. She became a bit uncomfortable with this idea that that's what's happening. So what we did was introduce her to the work of Luke Bretherton. Um, so this is a trailer for two years from now. Um, and uh, Luke did his PhD on the whole notion of Christian ethics and what is involved in engaging in Christian ethics. Now, to cut a long story short, uh, Luke's um, conclusion was that in the Gospels, Christian ethics is primarily about learning to offer hospitality to our opponents in ethical debate. So that was his framing of what Christian ethics is all about. So I think often Christians assume that our calling is to win arguments. Um, he was saying, no, our calling is to offer hospitality to those who disagree with us. So she tried to translate this into uh, her lessons. And uh, what she did was to focus on this guy. He's a man called Tony Nicholson. Uh, he was a campaigner for assisted suicide being made legal in UK. Uh, up until the age of 50, he was uh, very fit. This is him just sort of uh, uh, as a, uh, at that sort of age, rugby player, um, had a massive stroke, went on a holiday in Greece and ended up uh, uh, entrapped in his body. So he had no movement at all. Um, and he lived like that for a number of years. And he never won his case for assisted suicide because he campaigned for it. So what he did is he became the centre of this approach to teaching Christian ethics for Angela. And what she did was to actually do one lesson on his life before the stroke and one lesson on his life after the stroke. And then she asked the students to begin to work out why he wanted assisted suicide and what would be a Christian response to that. So what she did was to shift from... Christian ethics is all about having an argument. So Christian ethics is trying to understand what's happening in people's lives. So she had reframed her whole approach to Christian ethics uh, in an attempt to be biblical. Now, what she was doing there was using a critical realist approach which focused on how people interpret the situations around them, how they respond to situations, and how the Bible might relate to that. Um, and um, uh, that was one of the profound successes we felt about this approach. Um, so, just to finish then, I'm going to take you past that one. Back to Tim Farron. I think what bothers me about what happens in churches now and about people's perceptions of Christianity is that... We leave people like Tim Farron with no equipment for being biblical in very complex situations because they're often perceiving truth as being in the positivist mode. What I've been suggesting is that actually they don't need to change their theology, but they might need, we might need to change the epistemology which Christians assume operates when we live under the authority of the Bible and that a critical realist view gives us a much more powerful, fruitful and faithful way of being biblical than does the positivist view which seems to me to be normative in many people's assumptions in relation to the Bible. Thank you. Mm.
So I think you get a chance to... Um, I'll put that back up now, because you're going to <laughs> go on. Uh, there's a chance for questions and comments and um, challenges and whatever else you want. So, over to you. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, exactly, I agree with you. Um, in answer to your first question, um, we got to know the teachers quite well. So as individuals, we had a, a sort of idea about um, their sort of Christian backgrounds or some of them weren't Christians and their background of um, uh, in contact with the church and why they were in this particular school. Um, not enough, really, to be able to sort of start to unpack in detail how those two might in any way be linked. Um, so um, we didn't know enough to do that for each of the teachers, but I don't think there's any doubt that what they were, the struggles that they had with trying to be Christian in their classroom were, in many senses, related to their previous experience. The suggestion that we've made through the research is that um, uh, that somehow, and we're not quite sure how, there seems to be this pervasive assumption that a sort of positivist view of scripture is what it is required if you're going to be faithful to scripture. Um, and that they don't really have any experience of another resource for another epistemological resource. Um, and I suppose what we're suggesting is actually we need as a Christian community to think about how we do something about that. I don't know what the answer is, because I think it's actually a huge, huge question. Yep. Uh, a couple of thoughts um, What's your reaction to. I think one of the problems with this is the word biblical. As soon as we say a biblical view of this, people think they have to have those three verses to attach yeah. to it. Yeah. So it seems to me words like uh, worldview and theological perspective and such it implies ultimately biblical, but it doesn't frame in people's mind, I got to go find a verse to, to prove yeah. this, um, which invites, I think, the the opportunity to discover resources that are in, I forget, N.T. Wright's Act 5, the act we're in, to see that for 2,000 years, people have been speaking into that act in terms of the Christian tradition and worldview that we can draw upon. And many of those have a kind of respectability that the Bible, per se, doesn't have in the, in the academic context. Uh, another uh, thought is... Um, the, that we as Christians, evangelical Christians especially, are, are after what is true, but I've helped, found it helpful to, to reframe uh, what is good. Uh, that implies a different kind of search than yeah. just finding a statement that defines what is true. Yeah. It's in, goodness is enforced by truth, but teachers can find things from their Christian worldview that are good, that they can feel some freedom to talk about, that they may not feel the same freedom when they're yeah. seeking what is true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, on the true thing, I, th I think one of the issues is that um, uh, the word true has got linked to the idea of a proposition, uh, an indisputable proposition. Um, and that's not just happening in the church. I think it's, I mean, certainly in the, in the UK, it's part of a wider culture which is becoming more and more logically positivist in its understanding of knowledge and truth. Um, so, you know, the, the rise of the supremacy of STEM subjects, for example, is something that we're experiencing. What counts as knowledge is only stuff that you can prove, in inverted commas, so you have to be able to 
measure it or show that it's true through a randomised controlled trial. And that sort of thing is going on all the time. So as a society, we're moving in a direction of an understanding of truth, which is actually, I think, unhelpful for us as people seeking to live out a Christian life where the word good, as I think, is, is a much more helpful one. Um, I'm not so sure I want to lose the word biblical because I think that is central to our faith, but I certainly want to try and reframe people's understanding of what it means to be biblical. So, I mean, one of my experiences was that we were, uh, we, we developed a resource for teaching Christianity and one of our, um, uh, other, the one other organisation countered what we've done by saying that, um, well, they liked our resource, but theirs was purely biblical, whereas ours wasn't. Um, and what they meant by that was that they'd actually just put texts in and we hadn't. So there's, But there was a definite sense that to be purely biblical was, was much more faithful than to do what we did. Trevor, can you talk a little bit about what you think each of these groups is most afraid of? Uh, the, the groups in so terms of the three. the positivists, the critical realists, and the radical constructivists. What's at stake for them? Uh, well, what's at stake for the radical constructivists is the abuse of power, I think, where people use their own interpretations to... <clears throat> Uh, in, in the exercise of power. And actually, I, I mean, it's going on all the time. Um, people interpret the Bible in order to maintain their own um, authority and supremacy. Um, it goes on in churches. It, it's happening all the time. So that's what the radical constructivists are afraid of. I think what the, um, uh, the positivists are afraid of is... Um, uh, is um, well, error. <laughs> You know, the sense that uh, we've got things wrong and therefore having to be certain that we've got it right becomes very important. So to admit you don't, you're not sure or you might have got something wrong is, you know, that's a, that's a major failing to have done that. Because after all, um, if God is unchanging, his word is unchanging, uh, uh, therefore what I read must be unchanging. Uh, and if anything changes, wow, that's a real threat. So that's... Um, uh, I think the threat, the, the worry about critical realism. Um, I'm not sure about that. I think the worry about critical realism is actually the abuse of scripture, probably. That, that, that you know, what we might be doing is by the way we interpret, we might be abusing the text. So it's about trying to make sure that we don't do that. Um, concerning then the possibility of abusive text, could you speak some then to the preservation of a community of interpretation? Because when she asked about fear amongst the critical realists, one of my first thoughts was the absence of community. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think that's one thing that comes into critical realism, which is an insight from the more sort of postmodern relativist end of things, that um, community is very important in the construction of knowledge um, and understanding. And um, uh, there is a danger that, as Christians, we rely on particular individuals who become sort of almost like popes in terms of their interpretation of Scripture, uh, and they become the ones on the conference circuits who everyone goes to hear. Um, and they're never challenged uh, because you don't challenge in the positivist sort of uh, mode. Uh, whereas in the critical realist mode, it is th that notion of debate and uh, correction of each other and uh, listening to the views of another person becomes very important in the discovery of true knowledge. So, yeah, I agree absolutely. Is the lady behind you? This is good because actually, whoever holds the microphone has the authority here. So. Um, I'm curious uh, at what age or how young children can be introduced to um, 
the complexity, uh, holding together diverse views, the kind of self-reflexivity uh, and, and self-awareness that's demanded by critical realism. So could you speak a little bit about like, how to use this approach in a way that's developmentally okay. appropriate? Yeah. Um, I, I think very young is the answer, but not through a lecture like I've just given on <laughs> critical realism and biblical authority. Uh, it may do, for example, in relation to how do teachers respond to what children say. So if a child uh, says something in a, say, I don't know, a Bible class, does the teacher say, no, that's wrong? Uh, does anybody else know what the right answer is? Or does the teacher say, that's interesting. Can you tell me why you said that? What does anybody else think? Or the teacher says, okay, let's make a collage of everything we think and we'll put it all on the wall and we can just... Because <laughs> those are underpinned by three very different epistemologies. So it's a culture of a classroom, I think, that, um, that matters. Because they're, they're, my guess is that most children coming from Christian homes are used to the notion that they have to guess what the meaning is. And it's not about a process of discovery and asking questions, it's a process of trying to guess what's in, in the teacher's mind. Um, and so that's one way in which I think it happens. I think, so the experience of teaching and learning that they have is very important. Um, and, uh, and how they handle texts, you know, what sort of practices there are in the classroom around texts. Um, do you just use them as sort of one-liners to uh, establish a particular point? Or do you, do you actually talk about whole stories? Um, so that's the difference between a sort of propositional approach, which tends to go with a very positive thing, and a narrative approach, which tends to go with a critical realist view. So it's about how they experience their encounter with scripture. But that involves quite a lot of creative pedagogy. So that's really hard work for the teacher because they've got to understand what they're doing. Um, since, since you're pretty close to, yeah. to closing the proceedings for us, um, what should we do next? I mean, you sort of, there's, there's this picture of that, you know, chimes in with what I see of teachers as kind of like having a lot of goodwill. You know, you, you want to connect your faith to your teaching, yeah. but you're not sure how, and it feels kind of weird and so on. Okay. And, you know, do we need to teach teachers more epistemology? Do we need to train pastors better so that student teachers get a better formation? You know, probably all of the above and 15 more things. But yeah. do you have a sense of kind of what the most urgent intervention might be to try to improve what you've described? Uh, I... Yeah, I mean, that's a huge question. My immediate response to that is to say that we need to begin thinking about how in teacher education we can raise the student teacher's awareness of the importance of epistemology and, and find ways of doing that which are relevant and me meaningful. So, for example, I use that old woman, young woman thing because I think it helps make the point fairly quickly in a way that uh, a two-hour lecture on the differences between positivist, critical realist, and constructivist approaches to scripture wouldn't do it. Um, and then I think we need to do constant processes of showing how that translates into pedagogy. Um, so uh, it's not necessarily that they need to have a history of knowledge, but they need to be able to interrogate their practice in the classroom in the light of different approaches to knowledge. We, I'm just looking to see whether that was a, a, an end from David or... <laughs> but, but one more question, I think, yeah. Uh, so my question is, when, when you talk about hospitality, right, and the hospitality towards questions yeah. um, and debate and the, the searching after truth, and, and how does that differ, if at all, uh, as Christians engage in public life with a, a wider sphere of, of people versus intra-church or intra-Christian school um, dialogues and conversations? Um, 
if at all? Does it differ? Does it not? Um, I think one of the things that happens for a lot of Christians is that they, they enter public life fearful because they're fearful about A, being able to, you know, be Christian in the environment and be fearful that somehow they might get contaminated or, uh, you know, lose their faith. Um, and it seems to me that one of the things that we as Christians need to do in entering public life is to work out our missiology of what we're doing, in other words, what it, our, how we behave in these contexts. And my feeling would be that we have to be much less fearful and much more positive about actually what we're going to gain from the experience of being... I mean, I work for this um, organisation called the RE Council of England and Wales. Uh, it, it's been one of the most enlightening experiences in my life. I work with atheists and or religious people of all sorts of denominations, um, New Age people, pagans, all talking about religious education in public schools in the UK. And I've learned an awful lot from all these people because the questions they ask make me think about my engagement with scripture. And I learn a lot from it. And that enables me also to then go and say things into the situation which I hope are helpful. Um, I'll finish with one story. Um, uh, I did a session once in debate where I used some of David's stuff on languages and one of the people I was debating with was um, the uh, chief executive of the British Humanist Association and his response to David's stuff on modern languages and hospitality was well that's not Christian and I said to him well what do you mean it's not Christian and he said well I like it and I'm an atheist so it can't be Christian <laughs> And what I felt there was a, a real privilege in being able to bring something for the Christian community into that public context and somebody be really, really appealing to, by it. Now, I obviously disagree with him about it not being Christian, and that was him trying to rationalise his learning from a Christian because that was really ba difficult for an atheist to do. But um, uh, I thought, well, it's great, you know, to be in this context and be able to offer something which is seen to be of the highest quality. Um, so I think it's a great situation to be in. And I, I, I don't know how Tim Farron works out his difficulties, because uh, I think that's a really challenging one. But I do think we need to think about how we help him to do it and others who are trying to do it. Thank you. Mm.